Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. Today we're here to talk about my Model 1917 Snubby. Now, briefly, the Model 1917 occurred because there was this thing called World War I, and when we got involved, we did not yet have adequate stocks of the brand new 1911 service pistol. So, the government asked Smith & Wesson and Colt to use their large frame revolvers and make a version that was chambered for 45 ACP. Since this is a rimless cartridge, these would be provided in a pair of three round clips. Drop two of them in the cylinder and you're good to go. And they would also eject nicely because they were in clips. Um, these did the job and Many years later, Brazil wanted them for its police and military services, I think mostly police, and ordered a bunch of them from Smith & Wesson, who was happy to oblige, often using stocks of old parts that were no longer in their production revolvers, and they sent them all merrily off to Brazil. These came back in the fullness of time, after the Brazilians were done with them, and um, they're known as Brazilian Contract M1917s. And they're not particularly collectible. They're sort of the low-hanging fruit of the Smith & Wesson N-frame, at least at this point, and can be had for not actually stupid money. So, I did. I got one. And uh, it had the standard 5.5-inch barrel, half-round front sight, and, you know, factory checkered wooden grips, and it was exactly what you'd expect it to be. And I had some fun with it, and it languished in the safe. Um, so, on one of the many gun-oriented web pages I frequent, somebody posts a picture of a lovely custom shop 620, model 625 Smith & Wesson, which is the successor to the 1917 and takes 45 ACP in clips. And um, people were unkind, many of them speculating about the ballistics in impolite terms. The words 400 feet per second were tossed around because it has a two inch barrel. And because of the size of the gun, that, that doesn't look like two inches. It actually is, but it doesn't look like it. And many people expressed the opinion that this was stupid. And I thought, how stupid is it really? Because maybe it's not stupid. So, after verifying that I could easily source a replacement barrel, I cut my gun to two inches and did testing using my defensive load which is an old-school Spear 200 grain flying ashtray jacketed hollow point. Um, they haven't made these for a number of years, but some time ago I happened to cross a couple of unopened boxes of the bullets and loaded them up. Now, out of my 3.5-inch barrel Detonix Combat Master, these make 848 feet per second, and in ballistics tests, which are documented in uh, the blog, they... When fired through four layers of denim into clear ballistics gel, they penetrate 14 inches and expand to an average of 0 0.640 inches. So they perform quite adequately out of a three inch, three and a half inch barrel. Well, typically revolvers are measured from here to the front of the cylinder, and that's two inches. But is this really a two inch barrel? Because a semi-auto, the barrel length is measured from the breech face to the muzzle. If you measure this gun from the breech face to the muzzle, it's a hair over three and a half inches. And I knew that ballisticsbytheinch.com had measured the effects of cylinder gap on velocity based on the length of the barrel from here to here. Um, which is not how the, you'll have to look at the article, I'll link it below. But 
what they found was you do not lose very much velocity from the cylinder gap. And this gun has an extraordinarily tight cylinder gap. So I cut the barrel and tested it. Whereas the Detonix Combat Master propelled the 200 grain bullet at 848 feet per second, this achieved an average of 841 feet per second. Now, yes, I tested them under different conditions at different times of the year, so there's going to be some variation from temperature, humidity, phase of the moon, arcane rituals, whatever. I don't know. So, but that's well within the statistical margin for error. So, there's every reason to believe that those bullets would penetrate and expand very much like they do when fired from the Combat Master, which means they're viable. And that means the gun is viable. So, and I liked it. I just like the look with the little stubby barrel. And I had thrown a temporary sight on it so I wouldn't shoot my chronograph. Um, I replaced that with a classic half round style front sight, which I carefully judged the height and location of by a sophisticated system of measurement called TLAR, which stands for that looks about right. Much to my astonishment, it shot precisely to point of aim, aim at five to seven yards. Um, God likes me. I don't know. So I also, I did other things to the gun. And you know, we really should show you those on the tabletop. Okay. So the first thing I did after determining that this gun was going to remain a snubby was I removed and bobbed the hammer and checkered the top with 40 line per inch checkering so that the gun can still be thumb cocked. I don't anticipate ever needing to do this, but why give up the capability and the serrations are kind of neato. Uh, I also, you can see, crowned the barrel, already talked about the front sight, which provides a pretty typical military and police style sight picture for these revolvers. I also made antler grips because antler is cool. And I made a grip adapter out of American Holly, which I think matches the um, antler rather nicely and provides me with a good solid grip. And I shortened the ejector rod naturally, wouldn't want it sticking out past the end of the barrel. And as you can see, there is virtually no movement in the front of the cylinder. There's no crane lock as yet, but um, I question the necessity since it seems so tight. Now I probably will install a detent in the crane just because one does. And so you can see here the markings from Brazil where they stamped all their guns. And I can't really make it out. It's rather worn at this late date. I did relieve the right front side of the trigger guard so that I can get my trigger finger on the trigger from the safe position without hitting the trigger guard because that's annoying. Uh, the trigger pull, I have not done the trigger job yet. And you can see this still has the original serrated trigger. That's going to change. I'm going to smooth all that out because it works better in double action, and this is a 99% double action gun. Um, in other words, I'm almost never going to fire at single action. At least that's my intent. I have not done a trigger job either, and yet despite that, the trigger is reasonably smooth and breaks at about eight and a half pounds. Single action trigger is nice and crisp, not too much over travel, and breaks at three pounds. So, there's a very classic aesthetic to this that I was deliberately going for. Kind of a noir, tough guy thing, just like I did with the 38. Oh, you can also see there's a patent mark here 
that says Brazil Patent Office. Um, I don't know why these were patented in Brazil. They're all made in the USA, as this gun clearly states right here. Um, contrary to some lore, these were not manufactured under license in Brazil. So, it's a nice, handy-sized gun. It is heavy, but it's no heavier than the Combat Master. I have a good gun belt, and I'm a big guy, so I could very feasibly carry this. And it only holds, if you chamber around and have a full magazine in the Jonics, you have one more round than this carries. And these are quite quick to reload with the moon clips. So, great classic concealed carry gun and a giant snubby. And I just love it. I think it's neat as hell. And I did enjoy shooting it. Recoil is a thing. But it's not uncomfortable or damaging. Still, depending on the ammunition, I'm pretty sure that after somewhere between 100 and 200 rounds, I would be done shooting. But uh, as it is, just really, really like it. Even though I don't particularly intend to carry this gun, it is a viable option and it has all the features and qualities or will have after I do the trigger job and smooth the trigger face, that I would want in a carry revolver of this type, a snub nose revolver. And that's sort of a, that's where the whole retro rod thing comes in. Because originally a hot rod was an old car that some guy took and made so it would go fast. And um, this changed over the years, in the 1960s, some of the most iconic and famous hot rods, yeah, if you took them out to a dry lake bed and tried to speed run, you'd probably die because they were practically undrivable. They just looked good. But the original thing was to make an old car go fast as possible on the cheap. And this is very much in that line. Now, when someone today builds a retro rod, they're building a rod in the style of the early hot rods. And while they're not going to take it out to a dry lake bed and do speed runs, probably, they could. Because they've got the details right. And that's very much what I tried to do here. Even if I never carry it, it's authentically set up as a carry revolver of a certain era. And, um, you know... Guns don't always have to be practical. 95% of my involvement with guns is hobby. And this fits right into my hobby. And it brings a smile to my face. I like to shoot it. And in a pinch, it is a practical device. What more could you ask for? Anyway. Um... Today threw something into sharp relief for me, which is that these videos cost money because my primers sucked. And no, those were not light strikes. We, I looked at the primers afterwards and those were good solid hits. That's because I am using large pistol primers that someone randomly collected over a period of years, put in a jar, handed to a friend of mine who kept it for another decade or more, and then handed it off to me during COVID when primers were scarce. They suck and they're unreliable. I need primers. I need ammunition. All these things cost money. So if you want to help, there's a link below in the description to my Patreon account. Kick a buck a month my way or two, whatever. It'll help. Maybe I can get reliable ammunition or primers and consequently continue to make these videos. I'm, who am I kidding? I'm gonna make the videos anyway. But help probably means more and better videos. So, thanks very much to my existing Patreon suppliers. You are a godsend and your contributions are not only appreciated, 
They help keep this thing running. So thank you. Anyway, I hope this finds you well. Stay safe, take care, and I'll talk to you again real soon.